Good day, Sam. First of all, thank you for agreeing to do this video interview with me today over Zoom. No problem. Good to be here. You know, we don't know each other other than through social media, and I think I've been connected to you for a couple of years, three years maybe, I'm not sure. But I've been intrigued about your performance orientation in the learning and development space, and that's what I'm all about, so I really like uh, following people who uh, have that orientation. But let's start off the interview by having you introduce yourself to our audience. Sure. So uh, my name's Sam Allen. I run a consultancy firm called Insightful Learning and Development. Um, I grew up in a rural village um, just outside of Lincoln, which is kind of like a sleepy historic town um, in the East Midlands of England. Uh, it's got a really big cathedral though, so some people know because of that. Um, uh, and I'm actually back there now. So I kind of, after a decade of living all over the place in the UK, I'm, I'm back there now with my family. Well, thank you for that. Uh, so where did you go to school and what did you study in school? So I did a, I um, did my undergrad at Reading in English um, and then after a few years uh, kind of wandering around the job market doing all sorts of things I did a master's degree in human resource management at Coventry. Thank you. Uh, so tell us a little bit more about uh, Insightful and what uh, what you do, what products and services you render the marketplace, what marketplace uh, segments you serve. Sure. So um, we're a small consultancy firm that typically works with um, small to medium businesses, uh, typically with businesses who don't have the internal learning and development, either capacity or expertise um, to do everything they need to do. And we do, uh, I guess, a range of things from kind of strategic projects like setting up an L&D function or um, uh, developing a learning and development strategy, uh, procuring tech, things like that, through to um, more focused kind of performance improvement projects, um, working with clients to identify performance gaps and design solutions and come up with recommendations to support them. So kind of a range of things but it's just me and, and a business partner. So um, we build really close relationships with all of our with all of our clients and kind of work with a few clients throughout the year, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. Uh, let's explore a little bit uh, some of the more interesting things that you've worked on in your career. And so can you go back to your start in L&D and tell us, you know, what was that job or role and what kinds of things did you do? And then kind of take us through, you know, wherever, whatever the path was that led you to where you are right now. Sure, yeah. So um, straight out of my master's degree, I did an internship at a company called Home Retail Group. It was a, um, a massive uh, retail organization. Um, and that was in kind of just generalist HR uh, with the view being, I did an HR broad um, uh, master's degree. One of the modules and my most interesting module for me was uh, one around kind of organizational development, building capability in an organization. But I had no idea really what I wanted to do, which area I wanted to work in. Um, very quickly, I got involved, as lots of people do, in supporting with training projects. I think they were going for a huge change um, transformation program. Um, interestingly, actually, they were um, one of their businesses, it was, it was an umbrella company, and one of their businesses was Argos, which is a very well-known UK retailer who were a catalogue retailer. So you'd go and you'd buy, you'd search through the catalogue, you'd get an item code, you know, that kind of thing. They were going through a transformation to become a digital retailer uh, in about four years. Uh, that's, that's how long the kind of transformation programme. Uh, and I started with them right at the start of that journey. So clearly there was a whole load of behavior change programs, um, managing and leading, change, you know, all of the usual stuff, whenever there's a change, the, the, the uh, portfolio of change um, training comes out. Anyway, um, after, after being involved in some kind of training, as it were, I, I felt like I was, um, had a natural aptitude for it. Um, it was an area that I was most interested in. And so my next role there was actually as a, um, uh, in a project team that was rolling out Office 365 across the organization. And I was leading the um, uh, training 
uh, element of that. So trying to build materials, um, workshops, whatever it might be to help people understand how to navigate all of the suite of tools, how to work in a way. But also interestingly, one of the things I learned there was around uh, kind of motivation and how massive motivation of the learner or the performer is to um, uh, th their overall kind of output and ability to do things. Um, so after, after that project, I then moved into an L&D business partner role and, and going back to the transformation in this business partner role, I had full accountability for learning and development for three functions and they were the digital marketing and IT functions. So those were the guys who were at the forefront of this transformation, moving from a paper-based, relatively old-fashioned business to a digital um, uh, retailer. And so that is where I really started to understand the importance of demonstrating return on investment. I had super analytical, non-kind of conformist, um, you know, non-corporate people who kind of challenged, well, why are we doing this workshop? I've not got time for this. And if I didn't have an answer, they just didn't come. And I kind of started thinking, well, hold on a minute. There's, first of all, there's more to learning and development than just workshops and face-to-face. -face. But also there's much more to understand performance gaps and, and why people need it in the first place. So that was kind of where I started being challenged. I also had managers there who were brilliant and, and really kind of, uh, one of them, Catherine, her name was, had a kind of mantra where if someone came to you with a training request, your response was yes and why. Um, so yes, that's fine. We can do that. Why do you need it? Uh, and that was that. That was probably the the first thing that influenced me to move from a place of yeah, yeah, I'll do that. I love standing in front of people. To actually, why do we really need this? Um, from there, I moved to Whitbread, a uh, big um, hospitality company. Was there for a couple of years, doing kind of similar things. Uh, but that's when I had a realization that I wanted to have more. I guess kind of accountability and ownership and more responsibility for what I was doing and a whole load of stuff lined up in my personal life and uh, working life, which meant that it felt like a really good time to see how things went kind of going it alone. That was about two years ago. Uh, and I, I, yeah, I haven't looked back since and I've been involved in a, numerous projects from wide scale kind of L and D strategy work through to really small, you know, uh, performance support material projects uh, and I've loved every minute of it. Tell, us, tell me a little bit more about the uh, uh, learning and development strategy kind of work. Uh, what, what's your approach to that? How do you, what, what's the result of that? Yeah, sure. So I guess some of it, I, I guess I describe it. So a, a current client actually at the moment is a good example where I um, We'll work with an organization to, I describe it as kind of building the infrastructure on which to um, build a learning and development offer uh, and to support people in the, in the organization. So really what that normally looks like is uh, starting with some level of organizational analysis, what are you trying to achieve? Um, a, um, you know, where is the organization going? What does that mean in terms of the skills that the business needs that it doesn't currently have through to for example, reviewing with a in-place in-house L&D team, how they approach things. So helping them to shift from kind of like that order taker space to an analyzing problems more and coming up with more, um, I guess kind of seeing the solution, not only as analyzing the problem more robustly, but seeing the solution as more than just your traditional training workshop or webinar or um, whatever it might be. Um, you know, through to with another organization, they just don't have L&D. They don't have any L&D. They're a startup. They're 18 months old. They've kind of realized, right, we need some stuff. We need to help some people with some stuff. Can you help us understand what that stuff is and help us design what that stuff might look like? So that's kind of like a full range of, of how I operate in that space. Yes, thank you. So you mentioned performance support, but let me just back up just a little bit here and ask, so what was your in? first exposure to what I call human performance technology, HPT, or it's otherwise known as evidence-based practices for performance improvement or human performance improvement. It's got lots of different names, but yeah. So, uh, so how do you refer to it and how did you get uh, exposed to that? What was that all about? So I guess I refer to it as HPT, human, human performance technology, and that's because of how I got exposed to it. So in the grand scheme of things, relatively recent 
recently that, that I um, uh, was exposed to it, learned about it. So when I, about two years ago, when I set up on my own, the, the, the team I was working within was, definitely wasn't in the order taker space. They, we like to try and understand root causes. We like to try and analyze problems. But I felt that going into a consultancy where I was going and working with clients who I didn't know, um, with much more responsibility on my shoulders to deliver a real kind of tangible impact. I, I wanted to explore more robust analysis models, I guess. So I kind of, you know, did the usual thing, went on to Google, uh, and, and I guess I just, I think I Googled something like, you know, alternatives to training needs analysis or alternatives to adding and things like that. Um, and through that kind of, re you know, self-directed research, I stumbled across a video, which actually I don't, I think, I don't know whether it was from your website or it's just on YouTube, but you also have it on your website. But it's a, a Gary Rumler um, video and he's talking through, I think, training needs, or no, actually not training needs, needs analysis, analyzing needs. Uh, and right at the start, I mean, it's, it's an old video. I think it was from before I was born. And he's using, you know, acetate, uh, overhead projector. And he has a performer right in the middle of this acetate. And he says, so you normally when you get a training need, you, you know, you get training requests, somebody comes to you, and here's the performer that they're talking about, the employee that they're talking about. And, and it's kind of like this assumption that if you ply that employee with the knowledge and skills they'll need, they'll go and you know, be able to do something differently or fix the problem. But we talk about performers as if they're hovering in this kind of white space he talked about right at the start. And it's about two minutes in. And I suddenly thought, oh God, we do, don't we? You know, I've definitely been there. I've definitely been in that space where we're designing kind of knowledge transfer. We're trying to fill these people's minds with what they need to know. And that was the start of my shift from thinking, move away from what people need to know about and move into a space of what people need to do. Um, and so from there, I learned more about, um, you know, um, human performance system, human performance technology, found people like the late Joe Harless and, and his kind of front end analysis models. From there, kind of just have, have kept going. Now, I, I don't think I'm a kind of, what's the word, kind of strict, um, you know, I, I, I don't just operate in that space. I, I'm not, I'm not like, I don't have really deep levels of knowledge. Uh, I've not studied it, you know, with anyone who um, kind of has mentored me in that space or anything like that. This is all kind of self-learned. But what I got from that was, I think the biggest change was from then where I was able to experiment with shifting my analysis models, trying a few, essentially at the most simplistic level, asking a few more questions on a few different things, like focusing on trying to understand the environment in which the performer is operating way more than I ever did before, which helped me to understand um, the performance gaps a bit better and, and really outline what the performance improvement would look like. Uh, and again, that's, that's where I moved away from um, focusing on trying to impact what somebody is learning and what they know and thinking much more about what's stopping them from performing. And I guess kind of removing that L and D ego of it's, it's probably not, it's probably not going to be a learning need. They might, they might need a re refresher on something, but it's probably something else that, that is stopping them from, from doing this. Um, and so, yeah, from there I kind of experimented and, and um, that was my first exposure though. So that's probably only kind of a couple of years ago where I, where I watched that video and had that kind of mini epiphany. Mm -hmm. Yes, well, there's, there are three classic Rumler videos, one from 81 and the other two are from 1986. Um, and he, it, there's a lot of overlap redundancy between the three videos, but uh, yeah, he's, uh, he gets right into it. And uh, he's, he's been a key influencer of mine since I first got into the business, but we won't go into that. But, but earlier you talked about uh, the, the response to a training request being yes and why. And mm. it's so Joe Harless-ish mm. that mm. it just, I, that's what immediately came to mind is that I remember being at a conference where he said, uh, because everybody was talking about, you know, you shouldn't just be an order taker. And he, and he was, he was not liking what he was hearing at this conference. And when he got up on the stage at one point, he said, and when you get asked for, uh, 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 given a training request, don't ask in your whiniest voice. And then he put on his whiniest voice and said, are you sure it's a training problem? And, uh, 
He said, my answer is to always say yes, and I can help you even further if you let me do a front-end analysis. And that was never limited to a training needs analysis, you know, what people need to know. It was really what mm-hmm. people need to do and what's causing them from not being able to do it. So mm-hmm. um, and I think I, it's, that, an interesting one. it's an interesting one because I think I posted on LinkedIn a little while ago saying we need to do more than just a training needs analysis. And then my whole, it was quite a, you know, a provocative post. It wasn't meant to be, but it was pro- quite a provocative post. People read that as, um, I, I, I think I wrote something like, let's stop doing training needs analyses, as in let's start doing a needs analysis. But I kind of think I left that bit out. <laughs> so I got a load of people saying, what do you want about you can't stop analyzing problems? I think interestingly in the L and D space, there are people who are doing, or at least believe that they're doing full needs analyses um, every time there's an issue. I'm not sure whether my manager at the time had heard of Joe Harless, understood any of these techniques, but I loved it and it was so simple. And I completely agree as an external consultant, not an internal person who has the time to necessarily shift people's mindsets i can't go in and say well you know i don't think that's the problem or let's see if that's the real problem absolutely it has to be yeah let's let's figure it out let's discover together what might be happening here um and you know i'll probably be able to save you some money um and the amount of times i've been able to provide a commercial benefit to a business who has had a quote from a person you know lnd person over here who's gone straight in based on what they've said they need and designed a 20k you know, um, management program. And then I've gone in and gone, I don't think you need that. I think this would really help. And actually we could spend the rest of that money on all of this, which would also help. Um, uh, yeah. So I, I completely agree I, with Joe Harris on that one. <laughs> yes. I think anytime you uh, suggest to training and development, learning and development, learning experience designer folks, um, the need to look beyond instruction, that's difficult for many because they either they they don't know how or they know how but are never given the opportunity to really hone those skills. And it's quite a challenge because your clients often know exactly what they want and they don't want to hear, you know, any back talk, any pushback. They just they just want what mm-hmm. they want because they're set on it. And what mm-hmm. I learned from Harless is that you take them on the journey and you discover together what the issues are and what the resolutions might be. And, and it's a mm. huge takeaway. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Let me shift gears just a little bit here to my next question, which is, uh, and you've covered some of this, but I want to know if there's anything else. So I'm just probing here. So there may or may not be something, but, but your biggest influences in all of this, people, articles, or books that you might point others to who are beginning the learning curve climb mm. this performance orientation. Mm. So, um, yeah, I've already mentioned Gary Rumler and Joe Harless. And if you Google either of those, um, I, I'm kind of, I'm kind of um, stealing my own thunder here because um, uh, whenever anyone asks me what their advice would be on, on this or on, in trying to move forward on this is I always suggest that you don't be put off by how technical some of it looks when you first you know, bring up some of these kind of process maps and analysis maps and models and things like that. But if you Google it, there are not only all of that kind of raw um, work that they did, but there are article after article who have taken that thinking and broken it down even further. So if you if you kind of Google front end analysis, you will get articles which talk about front end analysis, which bring in the work of Harless and Rumler and, 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 um, and they're much more easy to kind of absorb if you like. The other, the other things I've, I would pull out here are, um, as cheesy as it sounds, your website. So your website was one of the first websites that um, uh, I kind of stumbled across. And it, it, there's just so much in there to, to look at. So that's, that is a go-to. If anyone's kind of, if I'm talking to anyone about this and, and they want some resources, I always tell them point them in the direction of your website. Um, then on a slightly kind of different view, which is less... Um, kind of HPT, but absolutely in the, in the space of um, uh, robustly analyzing performance issues, I would say our Nick Shackleton Jones's 5DI model and the concern task resource model that he has, has built, um, and also Kathy Moore's action mapping site and resources. They do, they do a similar thing. They basically go beyond the training need and explore what's actually happening and look, and look beyond the need for knowledge and skills. So anything in that. 
but interestingly at the same time as I was kind of going on this journey I was also focusing much more obviously it makes a lot of sense to on bringing learning closer to the kind of point of work so the work of people like Bob Mosher and Gary Wise all of that for me is a journey you can go on at the same time so thinking about not only how you understand and pinpoint real performance needs that goes hand in hand with understanding workflow and where people are hitting those barriers and then designing content for that bit. So they would be my, they would be my kind of shout outs to, to learn more about this. Yeah, thank you for that. Those are all great uh, resources for people to follow up on. Let me shift here again a little bit. And uh, if you were to give us a 30 second elevator speech, and this is of course to provide a model and example to our audience that may need to be working on their own, you know, brief summation of, you know, what it is that they do. But if you, if you were to give us your 30 second elevator speech on what you currently do, what would that be? Me personally or, or business? You, you. Me. Social party, uh, somebody, a new neighbor comes up and says, you know. Oh uh, yeah, sure, sure, sure. Okay, fine. So I would, <laughs> I would say that I, um, I help, uh, people and businesses to understand how they could do better in their jobs. Um, and then once we've worked that out, I create support material that helps them do it better. <laughs> that's if I was talking to a neighbor. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, that's fine because uh, you know, that neighbor says, let's go get a drink or something. But uh, yeah. Yeah, no, so if, I, if, I was, if I was talking to someone in, in learning and development, I would, I would suggest that I do um, all of my work is based around a robust front end analysis to look to pinpoint kind of pain points, uh, understand where there are performance gaps, what's causing them, you know, the root cause of them, and then design intelligent solutions that are both kind of creative and engaging. Cause that's really important to me. I'm a very creative person, but also designed to support those real kind of pain points as close to the point of work as possible. Well, thank you for those two examples. <laughs> no problem. So that people should know that they should have <laughs> one for the layman who doesn't understand any of this and another for a, maybe a, <laughs> a, a potential business client uh, and <laughs> have an appreciation for a different set of language. Let me shift again here to, uh, as a lifelong learner, and I'm sure you are, um, what's your current focus or your next focus for your own learning? What are you exploring? Um, so I guess there's two things. So, um, I'm still on this journey massively. I would not say that I have kind of my, um, I'm trying to build a kind of front end analysis model that works for me with my clients that goes beyond learning and training needs. And I'm doing that by constantly exploring, um, front end analysis models, trying to get even further under the skin of HPT and, and, and so on. So, this is a constant journey. Likewise, the point of work, workflow analysis, you know, if you think I've, I've, I've been operating in this space for kind of a couple of years, there are certain clients that I can't experiment with and there are other clients where I can. So uh, from a practical perspective, I'm bringing more and more of it into the work that I do. Um, the other thing I'm trying to learn more around is um, kind of principles of agile. Um, I've definitely been caught short in my career you know, developing brilliant work, doing some great thinking and designing, but doing it in a way that is, you know, um, behind the scenes, takes ages. And, you know, you could be working on something for a long time and no one's even seen it. Um, and so I'm trying to, um, you know, learn more about how to operate in a agile capital A, you know, with, with the methodology of kind of scrum and sprints and, and Kanban boards and, and all the rest of it. So that, that's kind of a particular focus at the moment. Are you doing any writing that, uh, that you might share with us? A uh, little bit, I, as you know, I'm quite kind of, um, I don't know if you can describe yourself as prolific, can you? I write a lot on LinkedIn. Um, so I do a lot of my spare time, which is very, very minimal. I spend trying to um, generate discussion and con you know, um, uh, opinions on LinkedIn. Uh, I've written a couple of articles. Uh, some of them hopefully should be out in the next few weeks. I don't know, they're kind of with the people I've written them for. Um, 
as you can tell, I'm not really on it in terms of kind of when they're coming out and, and selling them myself. Uh, the, the main thing I'm trying to do is at the start of um, lockdown, I found myself in a position like loads of other L&D uh, people where I um, had about three weeks where my contracts had been kind of put on hold that I was in and I was looking for more contracts to start. And so I had three weeks where I essentially kind of was unemployed. I didn't know where the next project was coming from. And so I put all of my efforts into seeing, you know, seeing left and right people in my position as L&D people being kind of um, let go, made redundant, whatever it might be. I kind of thought, well, uh, something needs to change here. And, and, and I've been avidly um, watching and reading and listening to anything around the kind of evolution of learning and development, bringing it forward. How do we make sure that we're as effective as possible? Uh, and over lockdown, I've been doing a lot around what does that actually look like? We've been evolving for decades. And actually, a lot of what we're talking about now, which is really good practice, has been, you know, is, is decades old. So that I have been building based on the opinions of tons of people um, across the globe in L&D positions, been building a kind of guide to learning and development at its best, which it has a kind of a, a basic model for an approach for um, modern organizational kind of workplace learning and performance, um, which I shared a little while ago on, on LinkedIn. Um, but then what I'm working on at the moment is a breakdown of 10 characteristics that I believe are at the core of learning and development at its best. They're not shifts. They're not from, you know, uh, from learning to performance. They're not, you know, that kind of thing. It's just characteristics. So performance focused is one of them. Um, insight led is one of them. And what I'm trying to do at the moment, which is taking a long time, but I've been working on it for weeks, is to find resources that are really helpful, practical and free, aligned to each of those 10 characteristics. Uh, I'm, I'm kind of probably about 60, 70% of the way through it. And once that's done, I will, uh, I'll be sharing that with everyone as well. So that's kind of keeping me busy in the very little spare time that I have. Thank you. Great. I'm looking forward to seeing that. My next question, uh, let me set this up a little bit. Is there a favorite performance improvement term or phrase that you would like to define for us? And when I ask people about this, it's usually a, a term or a phrase that they don't like the way it's being used. They believe it's being misused or misconstrued and they'd like to put their spin, their clarification on that. What do you have? Mm. So my, mine's not like that, actually. I, 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 my, favorite, my favorite quote, you'll know it very well. In fact, I think you may have introduced it to me. I've got two. One is definitely, um, I don't know whether it was you to start with, but you say it a lot, which is essentially, it's not necessarily a direct quote, but it's just a shift from topic to task. That is, I, I put that into an infographic and you know, and, and quite we're doing it. And the amount of comments of, from people saying that is so true, and, and it's it is. It, it's a really nice way of helping people to understand the shift here, to move away from a. Um, and, and it's so applicable. Even if if you think about, for example, your learning management system. If you take a really basic example of a learning management system, if you have twenty resources in there, and on the one hand you've just got twenty topics so feedback giving feedback for example coaching um, and you've got really good resources but they just sit under those topics versus a learning management system where you've got 20 resources but they're all based around doing something so it might be that feedback is just shifted in how you set it up how you design the content to be how do you give feedback to someone when they're struggling with their performance for example at a really basic level, just that simple shift resonates with so many people and I think really helps you to choose um, to create content that's genuinely going to help people because if you can't do that shift, if you can't turn it into, at the very least, a task that people have to do and you know they struggle with, then there's no point in doing it. So that's one. Um, and then the other one is from the late Joe Harless, which is the... Um, Inside every, uh, inside every fat course is a thin job ace crying to get out. Um, again, I think that probably was you <laughs> who introduced me to that one as well. 
Um, but I, I love it. It's so true. Uh, and I think it's just a really good way to summarize where we are, or at least have been as an industry and where we could get to. The sad thing about all of this, I'm not sure where I got the uh, shift from the topics to tasks. Uh, I don't know if I came up with that or if I've just uh, borrowed that from somebody else uh, yeah. over the years, but all of these things have been so true for so long and it's a real differentiator to, for those like you. And that's what excited me about and, what, and, and, and drove me to ask you to do this video with me is that I'm very happy to see a lot of the uh, uh, younger group, if you will, because I'm, you know, I'm an old guy. And, uh, but I like to see younger people picking up the mantle of a performance orientation. And there's a lot of models out there that are very good. Um, and embracing that and getting away from content for the content's sake, behaviors for the sake of behaviors, and really looking at what are the tasks, what are the outputs, and what are the requirements for both of those and avoiding training, instruction, learning, when it's not going to do anything but increase expenses. Um, and mm -hmm. often, you know, that's just what, what exists out here. And uh, so I'm happy to see you promoting a performance orientation and bringing this up and using different language and a different perspective uh, to the people on LinkedIn and elsewhere. So I'm I, I thank you for doing all of that. Uh, my mentors are probably smiling in their graves to know that some of their good work uh, is being is 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 carrying forward, and yet I'm sure they are plenty frustrated with uh, the current mm. state of things. So again, thank yeah. you for uh, championing uh, that performance orientation. Right. I appreciate that, Guy. Thank you. Um, so. Question is redundant with what we've covered already here, but I, I wanted to give you a chance to expound, if you will, on any of the people who have influenced you and what those specifics might be. This might even be a shout out to some clients or people in your past that, that had an influence and you would like to thank them publicly. But again, I'm trying to help people coming into the business or wanting to make the change the shift from a, a from learning to performance um, and maybe they'll follow up with those people uh, look up their writings or connect with them on social media but uh, who would you have for us uh, I think I think I probably mentioned them all um, I probably answered the question throughout all of the other questions so to, to make it really simple if someone's listening to this answer right now and just wants to know where to start I would suggest that Gary Rumler and Joe Harless are where you start in terms of kind of going right back to the um, some of the principles and the models of the core of this. If you want, but but I, but going in with the caveat there that to, at first glance these aren't these aren't simple tools to just pick up and drop. So if you're then thinking, well, actually, I'd like to do something different, but I kind of don't have time to really get under the skin of these, and I do want something to pick up and drop. Then you can use things like um, uh, Kathy Moore's action mapping. Literally has a you know a process flow where you just ask yourself questions based on every single training need to understand whether you need it. I think um, uh, that would be a definite go to. Um, and then I guess the other people I've, I've mentioned, being um, Gary Wise and Bob Mosier, are great people to I guess connect it up with the designing for the point of work and designing for kind of moments of need as, as Bob Mosier would, would talk about it. And then other, other than that, the only person I should shout out really is, is Catherine Braybrook, who was my manager at the time, who had that principle of um, uh, yes and why, you know, that kind of be supportive. We've got to take them on the journey. We've got to meet them where they're at. She'd say a lot of that kind of thing, but was pretty kind of true to her word in terms of why are we doing this? And she would challenge the team just as, as much as she would external stakeholders. She also, just incidentally, um, allowed me to go part time at my role um, just before moving into uh, my setting up on my own. So essentially, have a go and see how it went. So if it wasn't for her, I wouldn't be kind of where I am now. So if I'm going to shout out anyone for my career, it will be her. I think. Good. Excellent. Thank you. Well, uh, Sam, thanks so much for agreeing to do this video interview with me. And you, you've kind of answered this already, but um, 
parting words of wisdom or guidance for our audience, especially those new. So you've talked about go explore Rumler, Harless, uh, or um, uh, Bob Mosier, et cetera. Um, what else would you say to them? Uh, you know, because people come into this field and there's a lot of competing, overlapping terminology. It's really unclear. There's a lot of different models. Um, you know, what, what would your guidance be to somebody brand new that uh, came up and asked you for advice? I, I would suggest um, not to overcomplicate it. So to, to start with, I guess kind of sense check where you're at at the moment, review where you're at at the moment. Um, do you ask yourself now, if you get a training request or if you're uh, in conversation with a stakeholder about potential need for some training or some support, how much of your analysis is done with, first of all, think about your audience types. So do you do, you do all of your analysis with the person who comes to you to ask you? Do you maybe speak to one other person? That, that there is a quick win. Broaden that out. Go and speak to the performers, the people who are doing the thing that these people who might have come to you have said they're not doing very well. Don't go to them and say, are you doing this thing very well? You know, that's kind of the next stage is to then know what questions to ask them and how to understand that. But I guess it's, it's not overcomplicating it. So if you're, if, to take a really practical example, if your um, management training is the example that people use because it's just a constant churn in our industry. Everyone just needs management training, but it's so, it has so much of a tendency to become a topic centric, bigger than it needs to be, program, event based, yada, yada, yada. So it's a really great example to use. If you're, and quite often, it will be a senior manager who comes to you and says, uh, we need some management training. We, our managers aren't very good at whatever. So as an example there, not only are you doing, um, should you be doing kind of an organizational level understanding um, you know, where that organization is going, how, how this kind of problem fits into that. I mean, maybe that's more for me as an external consultant. Maybe we wouldn't have to do that quite so much. But essentially, you want to be speaking to and understanding the performer. So people in that line manager position, you also want to know who the people that they're managing, what they think of their managers in terms of how good they are. You want to understand from a senior level, people, uh, kind of your, I guess, kind of business um, matter experts, what they think of the situation. But it's not just about, you know, once you've got your audience type, it's not just about what, uh, who you speak to, it's about kind of what you do with them, what questions you ask, what observations you do, what level of assessment you do. But even after all of that, the other kind of top tip bit of advice I would suggest is to go beyond the assumption that there is a problem with these people's performance down, and that that problem is down to them not knowing something or just not having the skills Nine times out of 10, when as I've kind of broadened out my analysis to look at things like the size of their teams, the um, communication between teams, uh, the systems that they're having to use, nine times out of 10, there is something pretty major in that space that's stopping them. A really good example would be, I spoke to, I was working with a business, there is a particular area of the business where in all of my senior level analysis, it came back as this area is probably the area they're just, they're not, they're not getting it as, as well as we want them to. They're not doing as, as good a job as we want them to in terms of managing their people. When I went and did the analysis and spoke to some people who were the line managers in that particular area, a handful of them had teams of 40. How can you expect a manager with 40 people, most of which are spaced around the UK and they're managing virtually, to be having really rich performance and development conversations, which was incidentally the thing that the senior level people were saying they weren't doing very well. Perfect example of where and all you have to do is recommend that they review that. You know, as an L&D professional, you don't have to go in and say, right, we need to fix this. We need to do some org design. We need just, by the way, this is, we'll, we'll help with this. We'll help with this. By the way, this is probably a major factor. You might want to think about how those teams are structured going forward. That, that's a really good example of where you don't need to have super complex analysis models, just bring probably a few more people than you normally would into the analysis, ask them some slightly different questions and look at some slightly different stuff that you might not have done before. And then don't filter your recommendations, just maybe think, okay, we can help with this bit, which might be 30%, the rest do what you will with. So it was a bit of a ramble, but um, 
<laughs> hopefully it was hopefully it was good advice. No, I, I think that's very good advice. Um, again, Sam, thank you so much for doing this video interview with me today. And I wish you all the best uh, going forward and uh, championing a, a performance orientation. Thank you so much. Thanks very much, Guy.